Um, Greg is not with us today, as you saw probably on your bulletin. We've got Mr. Jim Hobson here, and we just feel so blessed to have Jim here with us today. He is the National Director of Christ Life Ministries, and he is very passionate about this process called the Ultimate Journey, in which he helps people go through the process of moving from bondage of various things in their past to freedom and wholeness um, with our loving Christ, our loving Creator. So I just cannot say enough good things about, about him and what he's doing and the message he's going to share with us today. We are honored to have him, so please help me welcome Jim Hobson. Well, good morning. I am uh, excited to be here, round three, I guess, of the uh, services. Um, it is a blessing. We've been um, working with your church now for about seven or eight years, as the Ultimate Journey is a part of one of the programs that they offer here. And uh, I just want to take a couple of minutes just to uh, talk about it, but I'm not going to be uh, speaking about the Ultimate Journey, but I want to share a little bit about just to set the stage for what I'm talking about. Okay, the ultimate journey, we uh, see it as it's modeled after the biblical uh, exodus of the Israelites out of Egypt. And if you think back with me, if you would, uh, to that account, and there was, you know, they were, if you were one of those Israelites, and there we were, that if you were born into slavery, you'd been a slave all of your lives, been there, there's 400 years of slavery taking place there, and then God hears the cries of his people. And sends Moses down to them, to, to Pharaoh, and says, let my people go, that they might come and worship me. Now, that would be pretty exciting. And I don't want to belabor the process of that, because there's so much we could tell about it. But, you know, think about it as then uh, God uh, manifests those ten magnificent plagues to show his power and dominion over all the gods of Egypt. And finally, uh, Pharaoh uh, releases the people uh, after that tenth and final plague of the death of the firstborn of each household, and uh, the Israelites begin to march out. And different theologians estimate somewhere between a million to three million people were on that exodus. If you could imagine with me being one of those, how exciting that would be as we're marching out and, and there's this mass of people. And we're walking out, we're not walking out empty-handed. It says that, that uh, God put it upon the hearts of the Egyptians to give of the wealth of Egypt to them. So they're walking out with silver and gold and all kinds of precious uh, 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 wood and uh, sea lion pelts, all kinds of things. And as they're marching out, you know, there's this power and excitement. We got the kids running around and uh, they're marching down. If, if, if picture two million people going anywhere on foot. I mean, imagine a couple million people here from Minneapolis starting to march down Interstate 35 towards the promised land. Did they say I was from Iowa? Okay, maybe I shouldn't have told you that, okay? But anyway, we're marching down, and it's, and it's incredible all around us. This is fantastic. We're free. And then we come up against the water, there, the, the Red Sea, and, and then we look back, and here comes Pharaoh's armies pressing in behind us, and we're trapped, and panic and fear sets in. And then God parts the waters, and we walk through on the dry land, and awe, oh, we're looking at the pillars of water on each side, and we get to the other side, and, and uh, we're rejoicing. But then we look, and Pharaoh's armies decide to follow after us. Tactical mistake. But they're on that dry land, pressing in closer and closer, and, and we're in, all of a sudden, it, it, it's, it, here they come with the, the swords and the spears and the, the chariots, and there's nowhere else to go. And they're getting closer and closer, and then God releases the waters and destroys Pharaoh's army completely, right in front of us. And we cry out that we have a God, and our God is a warrior. See, up to that point, we thought we were free, but now we really are. The enemy has been totally defeated. We are victorious. We are overcomers. There is no way to be taken back into bondage. God has manifested himself in a definitive way to make sure that we would know that we are free. As he put it right in front of us that we could see. And then God, through Moses, leads the people on through the desert, and they come to Mount Sinai. 
there at Mount Sinai. He goes, Moses goes up on the mountain and receives what we call the Ten Commandments, which is really just a preamble to an entire document called the, the Torah, which was literally written in a literary style of a wedding ketubah. A ketubah is a wedding covenant contract, and it was written in that, in that grammatical structure. God married them. And at that point, uh, Israel became his bride. And after that, throughout the, the, pro- the prophets would refer to her as the, uh, his bride. And, and when they uh, would go and, and serve other gods, they would be called the adulterous nation. But at this moment, they are the apple of his eye. They are his chosen people. They are his beloved bride, and they are one. And he now leads them on to the promised land. And when they get there, if you recount, remember the, the story, they send in the 12 spies. And the 12 spies go in and they bring back their report. And they, and they say that it is an awesome place. It's, it's, it's a land flowing with milk and honey. And, and, and there's huge fruit and they're carrying some of that fruit. But they also say that it's a land with fortified cities. A land with giants. And And the most telling part of that account to me is when then they go on to say, and we are as grasshoppers. What happens to a grasshopper? It gets squashed. See, that's how they saw themselves because their entire life, they'd gotten squashed. They saw this place this promised land, this incredible place that God had planned for them and was giving them, they saw it through glasses of slavery and saw themselves as grasshoppers. And the problem is you can't possess the promised land if you see yourself as a grasshopper. And so God has to take them back out into the desert Some might say to punish them. Others would say to discipline them. I like to say to rewire their brains. And what he was rewiring their brains for was to bring their minds into alignment with who they were now. See, they were no longer slaves. They were free. They were victorious. They had a God and he was a warrior. They were his beloved bride, his chosen people. But they couldn't see it. They're standing in the promised land and they can see it. They can smell it. They can run the dirt of it through their fingers. They can can taste of the fruit of it. Every sensory perception they have is their promised land. It's there around them, but they can't see it or experience it. Why? Because of the glasses of slavery. When you have a set of glasses, whatever they are, and for them it was of slavery, it distorts and colors everything around you. And you and I also, through our childhood and through this world, have had glasses framed and fashioned onto us. See, the Exodus was and still is the ultimate journey that God calls each of us on, bringing us out of our bondage of a past that's brought on by the voices of our past and the experiences that we had that shaped and formed our minds to see things a certain way. And he leads us out of that into the promised land he has for us, a place of freedom, a place of blessing, a place with huge fruit, the fruit of his spirit in us. But the question becomes for us, just like for the Israelites, what glasses are we wearing? And are we listening to the voices of our past and what they say about who we are, or are we listening to the voices of God and what he says about who we are. John 8, 36 says, So if the Son sets you free, 
you will be free indeed. If Christ has set us free, why are so many Christians still in bondage? There's a little book, children's book, um, You Are Special by Max Lucado, that I think illustrates uh, an aspect of this message that I'd like to bring to you. And children's books have a way of kind of sneaking in the back door on you. So I'm going to backdoor you here. I'm warning you, okay? But I think you'll find I'd like to read through this, and they're going to put some pictures up. So just story time with me here, okay? All right, here we go. The Wemmicks were small wooden people. All of the wooden people were carved by a woodworker named Eli. His workshop sat on a hill overlooking their village. Each Wemmick was different. Some had big noses, others had large eyes. Some were tall and others were short. Some wore hats, others wore coats. But all were made by the same carver and all lived in the village. And all day, every day, the Wemmicks did the same thing. They gave each other stickers. Each Wemmick had a box of Golden Star stickers and a box of Gray Dot stickers. Up and down the streets, all over the city, people spent their days sticking stars or dots on one another. The pretty ones, those with smooth wood and fine paint, always got stars. But if the wood was rough or the paint chipped, the Wemmicks gave dots. The talented ones, of course, got stars too. Some could lift big sticks high above their heads or jump over tall boxes. Still others knew big words or could sing pretty songs. Everyone gave them stars. Some Wemmicks had stars all over them. Every time they got a star, it made them feel so good. It made them want to do something else to get another star. Others, though, could do little. They got dots. Puccinello was one of these. He tried to jump high like the others, but he always fell. And when he fell, the others would gather around and give him dots. Sometimes when he fell, his wood got scratched, so the people would give him more dots. Then, when he would try to explain why he fell, he would say something silly, and the Wemmicks would give him more dots. After a while, he had so many dots that he didn't want to go outside. He was afraid he would do something dumb, such as forget his hat or step in the water, and then people would give him another dot. In fact, he had so many gray dots that some people would come up and give him one for no reason at all. He deserves a lot of dots, the wooden people would agree with one another. He's not a good wooden person. After a while, Punchinello believed them. Uh, I'm not a good Wemmick, he would say. The few times he went outside, he began to hang around other Wemmicks who had a lot of dots. He felt better around them. One day, he met a Wemmick who was unlike any that he had ever met. She had no dots or stars. She was just wooden. Her name was Lucia. It wasn't that people didn't try to give her stickers, it's just that the the stickers didn't stick. Some of the Wemmicks admired Lucia for having no dots, so they would run up and, and give her a star, but it would fall off. Others would look down on her for having no stars, so they would give her a dot, but it wouldn't stay either. That's the way I want to be, thought Punchinello. I don't want anyone's marks. So he asked the stickerless Wemmick how she did it. Why, it's easy, Lucia replied. Every day I I just go to see Eli. Eli? Yes, Eli, the the woodcarver. I sit in the workshop with him. Why? Why don't you find out for yourself? Go up the hill. He's there. And with that, the, the Wemmick who had no stickers turned and skipped away. But, but, but will he want to see me? Punchinello cried out. Lucia didn't hear him. So Punchinello went home. He sat near a window and, and watched the wooden people as they scurried around, giving each other stars and dots. It's not right, he muttered to himself. And he decided to go see Eli. 
He walked up the narrow path to the top of the hill and stepped into the big shop. His wooden eyes widened at the size of everything. The stool was as tall as he was. He had to stretch on his tiptoes to see the top of the workbench. A hammer was as long as his arm. Punchinello swallowed hard. I'm not staying here. And he turned to leave. Then he heard his name. Punchinello. The voice was deep and strong. Punchinello stopped. Punchinello, how good to see you. Come and let me have a look at you. Punchinello turned slowly and looked at the large bearded craftsman. You know my name? The little wimmick asked. Oh, of course I do. I made you. Eli stooped down and picked him up and set him on the bench. Mmm, the maker spoke thoughtfully as he looked at the gray dots. Look like you've been given some bad marks. I, I didn't mean it, Eli. I, I really tried hard. <laughs> oh, you don't have to defend yourself to me, child. I don't care what the other Wimmicks thinks. You, you don't? No, and you shouldn't either. Who are they to give stars or dots? They're Wimmicks, just like you. What they think doesn't matter, Punchinello. All that matters is what I think. And I think you are pretty special. Punchinello laughed. Me, special? Why? I, I can't walk fast. I can't jump. M my paint is peeling. Why do I matter to you? Eli looked at Punchinello, put his hands on those small wooden shoulders, and, and spoke very slowly. Because you're mine. That's why you matter to me. Punchinello had never had anyone look at him like this, much less his maker. He didn't know what to say. Every day I've, I've been hoping that you'd come, Eli explained. I came because I met someone who had no marks, said Punchinello. I know. She told me about you. Why don't the, the stickers stay on her? The maker spoke softly. Because she has decided that what I think is more important than what they think. The stickers only stick if you let them. What? The stickers only stick if they matter to you. The more you trust my love, the less you care about the stickers. I, I, I'm not sure I understand. Eli smiled. You will, but it will take some time. You've got a lot of marks. For now, just come. Come to see me every day, and let me remind you how much I care. Eli lifted Punchinello off the bench and, and set him on the ground. Remember, Eli said to the Wemmick as he walked out the door, you are special because I made you, and I don't make mistakes. Punchinello didn't stop, but in his heart he thought, I, I think he really means it. And when he did, a dot fell to the ground. When did the dot fall to the ground? Was it when Punchinello met someone who had no stickers? Lucia, that name means light, that one who was bearing the light from Eli. No. Was it when he sat in his room and looked out the window and decided, it's not right, it's not fair, I don't want anybody's stickers? No. Was it, was it when he finally was there before his maker and his maker took those big hands and put him on his small little shoulders and looked him in the eye and told him the truth about who he was 
and that he loved him. No. It wasn't until Puccinello finally said to himself, I, I think he really means it. See, it's not about what other people say to us. It's about what we say to ourselves. While what happened to us in the past is significant, what's more important is how we see ourselves now because of the things that happened in our past. Let me give you an example. I'd like to do a survey with you today. How many of you know that God loves you? Raise your hand. All right. Okay. How many of you, if I said, okay, you can go home tonight and I want you to get out a Bible or look in pastor's sermon notes from last week or wherever you want to look, but are you confident that you could find scriptures in here that would tell someone else that God loves them? You find those? All right. How many of you know that if you have received Christ as your Savior or have come to faith or chosen Him as your covenant representative or however you want to phrase that experience, that you are forgiven? Hands? Good, 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 good. And could you find Scripture to show someone else that if they would do that, that they would be forgiven? All right. We've got to let Pastor know he's doing a good job. <laughs> let me ask you another question. You don't have to raise your hands this time. How many of you still feel shame or guilt over something you did 5, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago? Or sometimes feel lonely or abandoned or rejected or just plain not good enough? How does that match up? It doesn't. And why? It's because our, our brains, you know, what God does in us, he does in our spirit, okay? But our soul, which was made up of our mind, our will, and our emotions, those things have to be brought into alignment with what God has done in our spirit. You know, Nicodemus, when he came to, to Jesus there in John chapter 3 and said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He goes, you must be born again. What? Enter back into my mother's womb? No, not born again of the flesh, born of the Spirit. But just like the Israelites needed to have their minds rewired into their new reality, we need to have our minds rewired into our new reality, into who we are. I hear people all, all the time say, I know that God loves me up here in my head, but I don't know it here in my heart. It's not enough to know something intellectually. You can't just pass a true-false test. You know, does God love you? Yes, true. You know, do, am I, I, I've received Christ. Am I forgiven? Why, true. That's good, and it's important to have that understanding. But until that truth is integrated and woven into the core fiber of who we are, that it thus becomes the glasses through which we see life's circumstances, we don't experience it. I'm going to say something that's going to sound like heresy. Stay with me on it. You ready? Your relationship with yourself is more important than your relationship with God. Now hang on. And you'll understand it in just a moment. Why is that? It's because God doesn't have a problem with you. God loves you. You're the one that has the problem with you. In fact, you're the one that keeps you from receiving the love that God wants to pour out to you. Again, 
what God does in us, He does in our spirit, and we need to bring our mind, will, and emotions into alignment with that. I read earlier from John 8, 36, and, and I want to back up to John 8, 32, where it says, then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. The message, a uh, transliteration of that is, then you will experience yourselves the truth, and the truth will set you free. You will experience that. It's an experiential truth. What is the truth about you? How does God see you? See, when we receive Christ, Scripture says that immediately that we are holy and righteous and just, that we are overcomers, that we're joint heirs with Jesus Christ, that we are the apple of his eye, that we are members of his royal priesthood, that we are even the temple of the Holy Spirit who now lives in us. You know, the Apostle Paul says, do you not know that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit who now lives in you? But how do you see yourself? What would somebody look like that literally believed what God said about them? Is that someone's life who would be characterized by fear or stress, feelings of being overwhelmed or unloved or abandoned or rejected? See, how does that match? How can someone live in fear who realizes and lives out of the reality that the living God, creator of all the universe, lives in them. How can someone be stressed out who lives out of the reality that that living God, creator of the universe, who lives in them, loves them intimately and passionately and has a perfect and complete solution for every situation that they face? See, yeah. Now, I'm not going to say that you won't experience fear or stress or feelings of abandonment or rejection or those things. But you're, because those are God-given. He created us with those feelings, the ability to feel those things. But most people misinterpret and they take and they live in and wallow in and live in and out of fear and stress and feelings of unloved and of those abandonment in those places. When in reality, they're not supposed to be lived in. They are supposed to be more like, like the inter- indicator lights on the dashboard of your car. They go, zing, 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 zing. something's wrong. Hello, wake up. And what does that indicator light say? It's saying, you're doing it again. You think it's all about you and about what you can do and what you can pull off and that you have to be the one to do it and that it's all about your resources and abilities. And folks, I got to tell you, if you believe that it's about your abilities to pull something off, if you believe it's about your resources and what you have to bring into a situation, you should be afraid. (laughs) And you will live in stress. But when you recognize it's not about me, it's not about me, it's not about my resources, it's not about my ability, it's about my God who loves me and who is living in me. And we live that crucified life and people that just kind of cringe when they hear that. The crucified life is not some torture. The crucified life is the birth canal to true life because it's no longer about my life and about me pulling it off. It's about living out of his life, him in me, his resources, his abilities. The buck doesn't stop with me. The buck stops with him. The living God, creator of all the universe, lives in me, and he loves me intimately and passionately. He has a perfect and complete solution for every situation that I face, and he is my perfect and complete solution 
And he has come not only to give me life, but life more abundantly. See, now that's the set of glasses that I want to see life through. That's the glasses I want to filter life's circumstances through. It's, it's do you see your circumstances through God, or do you see God through your circumstances? See, if you see God through your circumstances, he's going to be distant and far off. He's not going to be really connected. But if you see your circumstances through God, those glasses, then you're okay. You're covered. It's all right. Here's a, here's a, a little uh, thing I, I want to share with you, a, a little truth, okay? Your brain only listens to you. Grab that. Wives, you know that, because when you try to tell your husband something, he ain't listening. <laughs> your brain only listens to you. See, I could come, and I could come to, to, to someone here, and, and, uh, and I could say, you know, uh, uh, what's, what's your name? Roger. I could come to Roger, and I could say, Roger, you're an incredible, godly man, and anybody who is fortunate enough to get close enough to you to become your friend is going to be blessed. Okay, I could say that to Roger. And when I say that to Roger, Roger's brain says something to him. And I don't know what it is, so don't say it. You'll ruin my illustration. <laughs> but when I'd say that to him, Roger's brain might have said, yeah, thank you. It might have said, you don't know me. It might have said, would you, would, you, would you still think that if you knew this, knew this about me? It might have said, what do you want? What are you trying to get out of me? I could arrange for all of Roger's friends, the people that know him, to line up. And let's say we get a hundred people to line up to share that with Roger. And they might, all hundred of them, believe that with everything in them. And if they were all to start saying that to him, he's going to respond. Maybe not with the first or second or third or fourth or fifth or eighth one. I don't know. But somewhere along the line, he's probably going to all of a sudden go, Stop it! Why are you making fun of me? Leave me alone. Why? Because it, it, it's like he'd have that feeling like somebody put a sticker on his back, like when you were a kid, kick me, you know? <laughs> what are you doing? Because his brain can't receive that. What are you telling yourself? It's not about what anybody else is telling you. What are you telling yourself? Change your self-talk, and you will change your thought patterns. Change your thought patterns, your glasses. Change your thought patterns, and you will change your life. That's why Romans 12 says, 12, 2 says, Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to see, to, to test and approve what God's will is, His good pleasing, and perfect will. That's the battle that Paul is speaking of in Romans 7, this internal struggle that's going on when he says, um, the things I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do are the very things I do. Does anybody else identify with that sometimes? <laughs> I love the Apostle Paul for sharing that with us. It's an incredible passage. That chapter is awesome. Romans chapter 7. I want to read a part of that and connect a little bit, and we're going to uh, have, have the passage up here for you to, to look at with me. I'm going to start in verse 15 where it says, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. That's a strange verse. Has he developed a split personality? Has he, has he gone into some form of denial? Let's keep reading. 
I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For what I do not want to, for what I do is not the good I want to do. No, the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. They didn't type that up wrong. <laughs> he repeated himself. Okay, do you see that very often in the scripture just like that? You don't. It's a, it's a very specific reason Paul did that. Because it's a, it's a, it's a traditional form of Hebraic writing that when you wanted to accentuate something, you just wrote it again. So he has some really important point he's trying to make to us here. Let's keep reading. So I find this law at work. When I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within my members. What a wretched man I am! Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Okay, I want to do that again. We're going to take the words off the screen. If you've got your Bibles, don't look at them. I want you to watch me because I want to try to help bring home a clearer understanding of that passage, okay? Okay. Here we go. little visual. Let me set the stage. Spirit. Flesh. One more time. Spirit. Flesh. Okay. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, spirit, I do not do. But what I hate, flesh, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, flesh, I agree that the law is good, spirit. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, spirit, but it is sin living in me flesh that does it. I know that nothing good lives in me, flesh that is in my sinful nature. But, for I, for I have the desire to do what is good, spirit, but I cannot carry it out, flesh. For what I do is not the good I want to do, spirit, no, the evil I do not want to do, flesh, this I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, flesh, it is no longer I myself who do it, spirit, it is sin living in me that does it, flesh. So, I find this law at work. When I want to do good, spirit, evil is right there with me, flesh. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law, spirit. But I see another law at work within the members of my body, flesh, waging war against the law of my mind, spirit, and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, flesh, at work within my members. What a wretched man I am, flesh. Who will rescue me, spirit, from this body of death? flesh. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. See, he brings it down to a practical reality for us. It's how we see ourselves. We are all born in flesh. That's who we are. Sons of Adam. When we receive Christ, we are born again, regenerated new spirit, and we are now spirit. But if we don't see ourselves as spirit, we still continue to live out of the reality of flesh. And most Christians I know, that's where they are. And I can show you how. It's because most Christians are stuck trying to prove that they're spiritual. I'm trying to prove it, prove it through all these different things I do, whatever it is, prove that I am, prove that I am. Doing what I call doing things for God in order to prove that I'm spiritual and good enough but here's the point. If I am trying to prove I'm spiritual, what am I believing about myself? That I'm not. Okay, and here's the fallacy of it all. What can I do to get there? Nothing. That's the point. I'm there because of Christ and what he's done for me. And when I receive him, I am immediately here. And I am holy and righteous and just. I am an overcomer. I am a joint heir with Jesus Christ. I am a member of a royal priesthood. I am the temple of the Holy Spirit who now lives in me. But if we're stuck doing things for God, then the weight's on us. It's about our resources, our ability. It's about the buck stops with me. I have to do it for God. But if, like the Apostle Paul, I identify with the Spirit living in me and that this is who I am, and it's not about me because I couldn't do anything to get here in the first place, so it's not about me. It's about him and his resources, his ability, his life flowing in me, then it's no longer about doing things for God. It now becomes doing things from God. And in that, 
That is a place of rest. See, burnout is for God. That's about me. And then he thinks really the crux of this, okay, that's how I see myself, but here's how it plays out into whether or not we experience that victorious Christian life or not. Because if I'm doing things for God as hard as I can, working, 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 and I fail, I blow it, and I will because I'm human, when I do that, then the enemy, Satan, the accuser of the brethren, the liar, the deceiver, hurls accusations against me, and I'm working so hard to be spiritual, and then I blow it, and he says to me, you think you're spiritual? I saw what you did. You looked at that pornography again? Are you ever going to stop? That addiction, can't you stop? No, you can't. You're not spiritual. In fact, I saw how you treated your spouse. I saw the way you interacted with your children. I saw what you were doing at work. You are not spiritual. You are flesh. You're a sinner. This is who you are. Get back here. Conform back into the patterns of my world. And he brings condemnation upon us. And we receive it because that's, it identifies with what we think. But if we see ourselves as spirit, and we're drawing and receiving from his life, God's life, and we're walking from him, and a lot of those actions from him look a lot like the same ones for him, but that's totally different. And I'm walking from him, and I blow it. Because guess what? I will, because I'm human. And I sin, and I step off into my flesh. His spirit in me calls out to me, Jim, that's not who you are. You're not a liar. You're my beloved son. You're a regenerated child of, of mine. You're holy. You're righteous. You're just. Come back, son. That's not you. And when that happens, it brings conviction. And conviction leads to repentance. And repentance draws us to God. When we are, are, are uh, when we repent, he is faithful and just to forgive us and restore us back into right relationship with him. See, it all gets down to what do you believe about you? Who are you really? Are you flesh or are you spirit? Are you listening to the voices of your past and what they say about you? Or are you listening to the voice of God and his truth about who you are? And that is the leap of faith. The leap of faith is not going off to the mission field. The leap of faith is not giving away all your money. The leap of faith is when everything in you says one thing about you, to believe God and what he says about you, and to act upon that. What keeps me from seeing myself the way God sees me then? Typically, my past. My emptiness, my hurts, my wounds. Until you allow God to heal your hurts and wounds, his love will never get from your head to your heart. You will continue to feel empty inside and try to do things for God to prove that you're okay, or you will look to other things to fill that emptiness. It's not about your circumstances. It's about your glasses. Remember Stephen, the first martyr, book of Acts? They drag him out of the city, throw him down, a crowd of people picking up rocks, and they're going to throw him at him till he dies. Can you think of a place more fearful, more stressful, more overwhelming, a place where you'd feel more rejected, more abandoned, more uh, not good enough? I can't. And, and how would we respond if it was us? I believe most Christians respond out of one of three ways. They'll do one of these three things. One is, Lord, strike them dead. They call down heaven against it. Or, Lord, take me out of here. Kind of, woo, cow gun, take me away. Or, number three, Lord, where are you? I've served you all these years, and now in my need, you've abandoned me. Where are you? That's about us. That's the glasses most wear out of that flesh. But we see Stephen with a totally different response. And we hear him as he says, I see the heavens opening and the Son of Man coming for me. Why? Because he knows that he's okay. 
and that his God loves him and has him covered and has a perfect and complete solution no matter what, even if they kill him. So he can look at those with the rocks and say, you might kill me, but my God didn't just give me life. He's given me abundant life, and he's got me covered. It's okay. And he's at rest and at peace, and therefore he can pray for those who are about to kill him. Because he found true peace in the middle of the most horrific circumstances. It's not about your circumstances. It's about your glasses and how you see things. You are living in your promised land. Can you see it? Can you smell it? Can you taste it? If not, it's the glasses. You're seeing it through your flesh rather than out of your God who loves you and has you covered. How do you see yourself? Are you the dwelling place of the living God or is there something from your past that is keeping you from experiencing all that God has for you? It all starts when we begin to see ourselves the way God sees us. Like Puccinello, it all starts when we can really say to ourselves, I think he really means it. My prayer for you is that you will see yourselves the way that God sees you and that you will see your circumstances through God's eyes. I bless you to see the truth about yourself and your circumstances, for the truth will set you free. If you want to go forward with God, let me encourage you to to join us on the ultimate journey, the exodus that God wants to lead each of us on out of the bondage of our past into the freedom that he has, his promised land for, for you. It's a safe place where you can work on bringing God's truth to the lies you learn to believe about yourself. If you do, you might just find yourself being transformed by the renewing of your mind and saying to yourself, that's not me. I'm not who I was. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you for your life. We thank you for your life in us. We thank you that you are not only the the creator of the universe, but that you are a very intimate and personal God and that you desire to have that intimate relationship with us. Lord, I thank you that you are the living God, creator of all the universe, that you live right inside of each of us, that you have a perfect and complete solution for every situation, that you are that solution, and that you came not only to give us life, but life more abundantly. And right now, Lord, I bless each one here to see themselves the way you see them. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I'm just going to invite the prayer team members to come up, and uh, you can have an opportunity to come and just talk with them if you'd like. Otherwise, I bless you to walk in his righteousness and be who you really are. Amen.